Okay, hello, welcome everyone to today's seminar. Uh, today we're very happy to have Marius Gerpenshagen from the University of Würzburg, who's going to tell us about complexity measures from geometric actions on Vita Soto co-adjoint orbits. So Mario, the floor, Marius, the floor is yours. So, thank you for the introduction. Um, the work I'm going to talk about today um, is in collaboration with Annalena Weigel and Johanna Erdmenger, also from the University of Würzburg, and has landed on the archive in April of this year. And uh, as you might have guessed from the title, it is about um, defining complexity for conformal transformation. Now, um, first I will give some introduction and um, what is complexity in general and what complexity measure are we actually using in this talk? And then I will um, introduce um, the ominous uh, thoughts of geometric actions and co-adjoint orbits. And I will tell you what these things have to do with our complexity measure that we are considering. Um, in the first part, I will um, derive um, the optimal path of this complexity measure. So since I will perform the minimization, and uh, basically tell you what this optimal path looks like. And lastly, I will spend a bit of time um, telling you what these geometric actions have to do with security theory and also with theory of theory. But first, some introduction or some motivation. Why are we interested in complexity in the first place? And the reason for that comes from the ADA CFT correspondence, maybe the big question that one wants to answer is um, what CFT quantities um, can be used to describe the bike ADS geometry. Now, at this point in time, it is well known that entanglement entropy plays a very important role in this question, since, um, you know, due to the real Takanaki formula, entanglement entropy reduces to a simple geometric quantity in the bike ADS space, and this can be used to probe the bike in the space and the bike geometry in general. However, um, just entanglement entropy on its own is not enough to um, explain the full bike geometry. In particular, um, there are certain regions of the bike geometry which cannot be probed by any RT process. And so from this, so these regions can simply not be explained by entanglement entropy alone. And a particular striking example of such an entanglement error is the interior of a wormhole in the bike ADS space. So at early times, this wormhole is just rather small, and the RT surfaces um, go from one side of the, from, from one boundary of the wormhole to the other, and go through the wormhole. And so you can actually probe the black hole interior using these RT surfaces at early times. However, um, as time grows, this wormhole becomes larger and larger, and at some point, um, the minimal surface um, consists of two disconnected components at different boundaries of the one hole. So um, at play times, you cannot say anything about the black hole interior just using entanglement entropy. And it has been proposed by Sasquin in 2014 um, that this wormhole evolution, the growth of the wormhole, can be described by a different quantity known as computational complexity. Um, computational complexity is a concept that comes from computer science and it basically measures the minimum number of elementary computation steps that are necessary to perform some algorithm. And there are some ingredients which we need to specify in order to define complexity, namely, first of all, of course, the set of elementary computation steps. And uh, for a quantum computer, these are given by unitary operators UI, and these are usually called gates. Then, of course, you need the reference state, this is the state of the computer before you do the computation, and the target state is the state of the computer after you have done the computation. So, this is the state that you want to arrive at with the algorithm. And then, complexity is um, defined as the minimum number n such that applying n unitary operators from the set of elementary gates onto the reference state leads the target. Now this all is very fine for um, finite sized quantum systems for finite number of qubits. However, um, the conformal field theory, which we want to, and in which we want to calculate complexity, actually is 
definitely not a finite corresponding system. And then the question arises, um, how should one choose these ingredients in a quantum field theory? Now, the gate set is perhaps the most important question. This is um, not really known so far, how one should choose the gate set. Um, but for the reference gate, um, this is conjectured to be spatially unentangled by Sussman in 2014. So spatially unentangled state is basically the simplest kind of state that you can think of, and these gates are supposed to create the, the complex entanglement structure that is, um, yeah, so all DFT states dual to particular bike geometry. So and on the target state, of course, it's obvious this is simply the CFT state that is dual to the bike geometry, which you want to probe with complexity. And now I said that the gate set is unknown. However, um, it is certainly um, clear that it makes much more sense to choose a continuous set of gates in a quantum field theory than a discrete set as you would do in an ordinary quantum computer. And if you choose such a continuous gate set, you also need to specify the so-called cost function. This is a function where you plug in one infinitesimal gate, and this tells you how expensive the application of that particular gate is. Since, of course, if the gate set is continuous, you, you cannot count these gates anymore as you would in a discrete gate set. So you need to um, specify how expensive some particular infinitesimal now there has been a lot of work in um, defining complexity in quantum field theory so far, and this work has mostly focused on tree theory um, as a starting point. And in fact, using tree theory, some um, features of holographic complexity proposals can actually be reproduced, for example, the divergence structure. However, um, other features, and most importantly, the growth of the wormhole um, with its dual to orthogonal double space, this cannot be reproduced only using tree theory, which is perhaps not very unexpected given that the conformal field theory um, that is dual to the wormhole is actually a strongly coupled field theory. So one would not expect um, to be able to reproduce um, these features just using tree theory. And in this talk, um, I will examine a definition of complexity that is valid for generic interaction CFT. And this will be based to a very large part on a paper by Caputo and Nakano that we in 2018. Now, um, as I say, I want to examine a particular definition, of course, and to tell you what choices of ingredients are making. And as I said in the beginning, for the gate set, I will choose um, the set of all conformal transformations, meaning all unitary operators U um, will be given as an exponential of some smeared function of the energy momentum transaction. And for simplicity, I will only consider either left or right moving and conformal transformations. And in the end, um, the total complexity will be just given as the sum of the left and the right moving parts, as it usually happens in two dimensional conformal field theory. Now, the reference state, um, for the reference state, I will take a primary state of this um, conformal symmetry. The reason for that is that one cannot actually choose um, easily a completely spatially unentangled state. So it makes more sense um, to choose, as a certain simple state, um, the highest weight state of this conformal symmetry. And the target state will be given implicitly through the conformal transformation that one applies on the reference state. And perhaps the most important choice um, that I will be making, um, again following Caputa and Magan, um, is using as the cost function the expectation value of this um, infinitesimal gate Q with respect to this gate. And yeah. From this definition of cost function, then of course the complexity is just given by integrating this cost function from some initial time to some time. Now, um, there are some properties that um, these choices of ingredients imply. 
und particularly important property is that the gate state is not universal, meaning one cannot go from um, an arbitrary state in the Hilbert space to any other arbitrary state in the Hilbert space, um, simply because um, not all states are related by conformal transformation. So in fact, one can only transform between states in the same dynamic here. However, this is not as big as on, uh, yeah, not big as a drawback as it not sounds like at first. Um, mainly because um, the set of conformal transformations in a three dimensional conformal field tree is actually very large. So one um, can transform between a large set of um, different states using only conformal transformations. And second, um, also because um, it is known how um, the bike geometry changes on the conformal transformation. So if one considers um, only a very small conformal transformation, for example, a conformal transformation that moves one from one particular target state to another target state, which is um, very closely related, then basically the length, one can think of the length of this um, blue vector as um, the difference between the complexity of psi t and psi t prime. And this can easily be computed using holographic complexity methods and then compared um, to the required approximation. So one can actually um, find a comparison to holographic complexity methods, even if one considers only um, a part of um, the full gate space. And a particular big advantage of using conformal transformations is that these conformal transformations form a group and can, one can use the structure of the VSO group um, to simplify calculations a lot. Namely, um, specifically, one can um, associate to every unitary operator in the gate set an element of the group, um, namely by the relation that um, multiplying two um, representations of this of these group elements as unitary operators together must um, be proportional to the representation of the multiplication of these two elements. And of course, the VSO group is, um, as I hope everyone of you knows, is the group of conformal transformations that of map sigma going to some function f of t and sigma. Um, yeah, and this function must, must of course be isomorphic. And then the group product is given by composition function. So um, multiplying the two of these group elements together um, is equivalent to applying these conformal transformations from the group. Yeah, and then after some um, calculation, um, one finally arrives at this answer um, for the complexity. Um, which is given as an integral over time and an integral over space. And here, f of t and sigma um, denotes the conformal transformation that is applied at time t. You know, there are two um, important things to notice about um, this final result for the complexity at this time. Um, first of all, um, this actually looks like an action function right here. We do have an integral over time and an integral over space. And this here would be our Lagrangian density. So if we want to minimize this function, this we simply um, need to calculate the unfair value of this action function. Here. And the second important thing at this point um, is that this um, complexity function includes um, a Schwarzian derivative term here. And later on, we will um, slightly modify um, the cost function and with that also slightly modify the complexity function and then we will see that this um, Schwarzian derivative term slightly changes and this will lead us to a geometric action. But before going there, I will first explain to you what geometric actions are in the first place. So geometric actions or geometric group actions as they are sometimes called um, these are um, concepts from mathematical physics, and they are basically action functionals defined on some orbit of a particular finity group. And the reason they are interesting um, 
for us is because they actually turn up in the theory of gravity in ASD. So um, if we can find a relation between our complexity functions and energy metric actions, we immediately have a relation between um, complexity and the gravity theory. Now, um, yeah, as I said, some geometric actions um, are action and functions defined on some orbit of the symmetry group. And to define these, um, we will need to take the reformulation of all these statements um, about unitary operators and gates in terms of group theory a bit further. So, um, first of all, we, we have already identified um, unitary operators as elements of the Zero-zero group, and we can also identify infinitesimal gates as elements of the zero-zero algebra. And um, simply because um, these infinitesimal gates exponentiated with um, unitary operators, and these are identified with group elements. And we can further identify states um, with elements of the dual space, so um, functions that map from elements of the zero-zero algebra into the real numbers. And this identification simply happens um, by the fact that expectation values um, of these elements of the zero algebra in the state um, are given by the application of this function V onto the element of the zero group. Now, um, using this reformulation, one can define two particular transformations, which are called the adjoint and coadjoint representations. And they follow simply from the fact that conformal transformations um, that are um, applied onto a state in the, from which we compute expectation values of some operator Q um, can equivalently be represented, represented in, in two ways, either as simply um, applying this unitary operator onto the state or equivalently as transforming this um, operator Q by um, applying new dagger from the left and U from the right, which of course um, is putting in this infinite expectation value and gives you the same result as transforming the state by applying UT into it. Now in terms of group theory, um, yeah, the, the first um, example where the state is transformed is known as the coadjoint go go transformation. And the second um, yeah, example um, where the operator is transformed is known as the adjoint representation. And formally, these are defined in the following way. So um, G multiplied by e to the t times x times g to the minus one, and that um, taking the derivative with respect to g is this form here at t equals zero. And the reason we need to put in an exponential here um, is because, of course, um, previously um, we were using um, representations of this operator, uh, and the representations of these group elements and algebra elements um, as operators acting in a Hilbert space. But if we're just talking about group elements, then it is not very fine to multiply a group element and an algebra element together. So we need to exponentiate these here two together by defined um, expressions. Now, um, the transformation of the state, the coadjoint transformation, is then simply defined implicitly um, through this relation here. So um, the Coadjoint transformation of the state applied onto X should be equal to the state applied onto the adjoint transformation with Q to the minus one. Now, another notion that um, we need to define is the notion of a coadjoint orbit, because it's simply the, the set of all states that are reachable from coadjoint transformations on some fixed space D not. So this D not here, um, this uh, um, is the representation of our um, reference state in the um, dual of the reservoir algebra. And this um, quadrant orbit is then simply the representation of a worm algebra. And 
yeah, using this reformulation, um, one can associate um, to every um, to every infinitesimal um, gate x from the zero algebra um, a certain change in the state dt, which is um, an element of this graph matrix. Now, um, to get to the geometric action, um, uh, one notices that um, this quadrant orbit actually forms a phase space um, which includes a natural symplectic form from it. Um, so, just a short reminder from classical mechanics. So, in general, uh, a certain two form omega is called a symplectic form if it is bilinear alternating among the generates and also has a symplectic potential also, such that omega is the exterior derivative of the pattern. And if such a symplectic form omega exists in some phase space, then that always defines an associated action by integrating the symplectic potential minus um, some Hamiltonian term here, which is the Hamiltonian. And since um, a quadrant orbit also forms a phase space, we can define an action in the same way, and this is known as the geometric action. Um, usually, um, it is actually defined um, with a vanishing Hamiltonian. Now, in um, most phase spaces you will see in classical mechanics, this is somewhat of a um, unusual choice um, because um, in most space spaces you would consider in classical mechanics omega would be just dp wedge dq and this um, action function over here would be um, the Neutronian transformation of the Hamiltonian. However, um, the, in the quadrant orbit, um, the symplectic potential does not have such a single form in, in the natural coordinates that we're considering. And as such, um, it is actually also interesting to look at actions for which the Hamiltonian vanishes. Now, um, on this quadrant orbit, um, the um, symplectic form omega is defined um, in the following way. So, um, putting in some, uh, yeah, dv1 and dv2, so some vector on the quadrant orbit into this true form um, is equivalent to um, applying the state v onto the v brackets of x1 and x2. And x1 and x2 are um, yeah, dual to dv1 and dv2 in the sense that uh, applying x1 induces the change dv1 and applying x2 onto v induces the change dv2. And one immediately sees um, from this definition that the symplectic form is actually bilinear and also alternating, which is nice to see. Non degeneracy is, is a bit more complicated to see, which, uh, which is the reason why one chose here. Yeah. But, anyways, um, the symplectic potential is then just given as um, applying V onto X1. And from this, um, one can define the geometric action by integrating over the symplectic potential minus, which is then written out um, in terms of group elements in this form. So V of T, um, as I said, is um, the quadrant transformation of the zero. So this is our transformed state at time t. And this vector down here um, is the representation of x1 in terms of group elements. Now, the reason why I'm telling you all of this um, is that the geometric action for the zero group has actually been derived previously by Alexei and Sashashvili in 1989, and it takes on a form that is very similar to the convexity function that um, was defined previously in, in this talk. Namely, it is um, exactly equal, up, equal to the convexity function up to the addition of this additional term. So um, previously, um, we had exactly the same form, but here, there was a quadrant derivative in, in the last term. And of course, um, this reference state v not here um, 
think he um, comes into play uh, as um, a function that maps any algebra element onto a constant. And um, yeah, that's parameterized by the conformal weight h of the primary state that we took as our reference state. Now, um, when, when I saw that first, um, I, I asked myself, um, well, where does this additional term come from? And, uh, well, it turns out that this additional term um, comes from a central expansion of the real theory group. Maybe um, if one represents um, group elements of the real theory group as, as unitary operators on, on the Hilbert space, then this representation naturally includes a certain state in the sense that um, multiplying two um, representations of different group elements together gives you a representation of the multiplication of these two group elements times some state in two reality. And in the cost function that we had defined previously um, as an expectation value of psi times the infinitesimal k q, the space comes for free. It doesn't in Produce any cost. And, and what we found out is that, is that um, by simply modifying the cost function to include a term proportional to this um, central term C, to the space C, then one um, reproduces this missing term and one gets exactly the geometric estimate of the multiplication. So by choosing a particular um, cost function one uh, finds that the complexity function is exactly equal to a geometric estimate. Now, are there some questions up to now? So sorry, uh, can can you can you expand a bit on 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 this issue of adding uh, stuff to the to the geometric action? I mean, like the, this was the previous slide. So so you mentioned that you can add phases for free. So so what you meant is that like when you integrate uh, from the beginning to the end, like this contribution vanishes, or or what you meant for free. Um, what I meant is that um, applying. Um, any unitary operator u um, onto the state um, gives the same cost as applying this unitary operator multiplied with a phase. And for that reason, um, these spaces drop out in the cost function and these spaces don't reduce any cost. And yeah, by um, simply um, adding, explicitly adding this phase term to our cost function, um, we can assign a cost to the space, and by doing that, um, we can reproduce the two geometric actions. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, okay, um, but can you so like can I can you can I ask you any question about your the comment that you just made? So does it mean that? Like if they don't give you any cost, doesn't mean that the action with the face and without the face are equivalent or what, can you elaborate on that? Um, what I meant is, um, let, let, let me just go. Um, yeah, um, the cost function is, is defined here. Mm -hmm. um, if we, um, instead of putting in here some, some, fun, some unitary operator u, we put in some operator u times e to the i phi. Mm -hmm. This e to the i phi um, drops out because we have the, the u dagger, which means we multiply e to the minus i times e to the i phi. So this drops out of the cost function. Mm -hmm. And the, the modification um, we did to this cost function was by explicitly adding to all of this, to this um, absolute value, of space of O of U, we added explicitly um, the space that I talked about previously, the space from the central expansion. So the cost function um, that we defined um, was given as absolute value of space O times Q plus um, the phase from the central expansion. Um, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Sorry, I, I was not, I was not sure what you answered to Michal, but I think I understand now. Thanks. Okay, um, then let me go on um, by deriving the optimal path of this, um, yeah, complexity functional that I have defined now. So basically, um, the on shell value of the geometric action is what I want to derive now. And as we will see, this, this optimal path take on a very simple form. One could uh, say that this form of the optimal path is just a bit degenerate. And yeah, let, let me just explain to you in detail. So um, as I said, um, the minimization of the complexity function will um, is equivalent to deriving the on shell value of the geometric action since our complexity function is um, equal to the geometric action. For that, we need to derive the equation plus motion. Fortunately, um, these equations plus motion take on a very simple form, namely just a harmonic oscillator of um, time derivatives of f divided by spatial derivatives of f and the whole thing again. Um, yeah, the derivatives of this whole thing again with, with spatial derivatives. And since it's, this is just a harmonic oscillator, we can find the most general solution. Um, this is given um, by a concatenation of two conformal transformations. One um, conformal transformation G that is independent of time, and one time dependent conformal transformation that only generates a phase when you apply it to the reference space. However, um, this general form implies um, that we don't um, get from the reference to the target state in a smooth way, but we jump instantaneously a time t equal zero from reference to target state. One can see that um, by noting that um, concatenation of um, two conformal transformations is equivalent to multiplication of the corresponding group elements. Um, and we saw that multiplication um, of uh, the representation of the multiplication of the group elements um, was proportional to um, multiplying the representation of these two group elements together. So um, we see that even at time t equals zero, um, when f not um, is simply the identity, we already apply um, this new g and we immediately jump to the target state. And at later times, we will only change the phase of this target state. And there's also another feature of this, um, of this kind of solution, namely, um, as it turns out, if you plug the solution back into the um, complexity functional, um, the non-trivial part that introduces the instantaneous jump actually drops out of the complexity function. So um, the conformal transformation that was time independent via sigma doesn't contribute at all to the complexity. And so in the end, um, we only measure a phase change. So this can be seen um, by, um, for example, um, by calculating the complexity between um, the reference state um, H for where H is not the reference state, and the reason for that is that the reference state is SL to R invariant, um, so invariant under um, L not and L plus minus one, whereas um, the highest weight states H with H greater than zero are only invariant under L not. So, um, yeah, just um, using um, reference state h with h greater than zero is a bit simpler. So let's consider that as an example. And in this case, um, this has not um, of p of sigma for this conformal transformation um, is given by the identity plus some constant, some time dependent constant, delta of t. And this time dependent constant is the coefficient of the l not generator. And of course, um, applying that onto um, a generic um, highest weight state, will um, only change the phase and this will lead to a complexity that um, 
Das pro Kurs eine ordentlich viel Geld kostet. Ja. Dann das same holds to even um, if preference and target states are completely different, even if we have um, an arbitrary conformal transformation P. Um, simply because this arbitrary conformal transformation P of sigma test. And now this is of course not very good news if you see that um, we only measure phase change. Um, simply because Sorry, can I just ask a question? <laughs> so naive. So I thought that your motivation was like uh, something like a state of Hartmann Waldasena where you take some thermophile double it and do e to the minus IHT. And, uh, and right, so this was your time evolution of a thermophile double state and H in a CFT is L0 plus L0 bar, maybe minus, uh, minus some uh, Casimir energy. So how would you call that change of the state? Um, yeah, it's, uh, in fact, it is not really a, a change of the state if you're just um, changing the phase of the state. Obviously, um, this is um, exactly um, the issue that I'm talking about. Um, I mean, the, the general solution of, of the equations of motion allows for transformations between two arbitrary states in the same one. Mm -hmm. um, be, because this um, conformal transformation P of sigma is arbitrary. Mm -hmm. However, this um, P of sigma with, um, yeah, parameterizes the instantaneous jump from reference to target state does not contribute. Um, and that is exactly the issue why we are measuring only a phase change with this concept. Oh, okay, okay. And you are saying that in your equations of motion, you are not finding any uh, any smooth paths? No, there are actually no smooth paths. And that's a consequence of the cost or like a properties of the Vera Zorro group, uh, of the Nielsen geometry for Vera Zorro group? That's definitely a consequence of the choice of cost function. If one chooses another cost function, then the whole situation will be completely different. I mean, a, a very, a very superficial comment on this would be that uh, in this, in this cost function, I mean, it's, it's a functional of the circuit. I think that that's the the the, the right way of uh, phrasing things. Uh, like, but regarding like what it really counts, uh, I think it's it's a bit tricky. And one, one possibly easy way of getting some other functional that would be easier to understand uh, cost function would be to have like this, this term f dot over f prime and put it in, in, in the absolute value. And that would be like a L1 cost function according to the Nielsen complexity, say. And this thing would stand a chance of, of, of giving something non-trivial uh, with the caveat that is actually quite hard to optimize it because these L1 cost functions are not that easy to work with. And, and this is a complicated case in which we have like uh, continuous variable sigma, right? And things depend on the sigma. But uh, that would be like, I mean, like, this, this would completely give up the connection with this uh, geometric uh, actions. Uh, but on the other hand, like this would be something that is easy to interpret and, uh, and work with. If, if you want to have like this linearity in f dot over f prime, otherwise you can have like f dot over f prime squared. And this would, this would be like one of the possibilities that gives rise to these Euler-Arnold Euler equations. Maybe you're gonna talk about it later, right? Yeah, I'm not going into detail into the Euler-Arnold equations um, because of time reasons. Yeah, this was just meant to be a comment. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, what I wanted to say now um, is um, the fact that we only measure in phase changes is a bit of bad news um, because phase changes are unphysical. Um, changing the phase of the state is a gauge invariant. So, in fact, um, we see that our complexity function is. Um, not gauge invariant, so we need to add a boundary term to, to cancel um, as phase changes to get a gauge invariant result. But of course, because we're only measuring the phase changing part of the conformal transformation, um, then the complexity simply vanishes when we add this boundary term. 
Now, you might say that um, it is not completely true that faces are unphysical. There are, in fact, um, very faces with where you can measure face tenses. And as it turns out, um, one can actually interpret this um, complexity functional as a very phase. Um, namely, one can um, think of um, these conformal transformations that one applies one after the other um, in time as uh, evolving the reference state by a time dependent chemical. Um, and if one, yeah, if one evolves the, the reference state um, with this time dependent Hamiltonian around the source two, then um, it was derived by Oplak in 2017, then that this um, reference state picks up uh, a very phase, which is of course x independent as all very phases are, and which um, takes the following form. And if you still remember the um, geometric action from before, then this is exactly equal to the geometric action uh, plus the boundary term. So um, for the very phases, um, these conformal transformations that one applies are of course arbitrary. The only, um, um, the only requirement there is is that um, one has to go in a closed loop. So we have to get back to um, the state that we started out with um, as a final point here. However, for the complexity functional, um, we are actually looking for the minimum of, of this um, phase thing here. So the complexity um, is simply the smallest possible very phase, which of course is no very phase at all. So um, by very equals zero. And yeah, from, from this um, equality of the very phase um, to the complexity functional, um, it is immediate that um, the complexity must then, um, yeah, the, the gauge invariant definition of complexity is um, always zero. Okay, so far um, for the optimum part. Um, now, um, let me get back a bit more to geometric actions and so uh, And also gravity theory. Um, yeah, as I said in the beginning, um, one of the, the motivations for this work was that geometric actions also appear in the gravity theory. And another motivation um, is the, the fact that um, the sum of two geometric actions um, is in some sense equivalent to Liouville theory. And Liouville theory also makes an appearance in another um, complexity proposal from path integral action approach. And I will now leave you the connections between all of these things. Now, um, first some review about the path integral optimization proposal. Um, yeah, the um, starting point of this proposal is the fact that um, Ground state wave functionals are computed by a Julian path integral. So the wave functional of um, some arbitrary um, state x naught with the vacuum can be calculated by the Julian path integral in the lower half. So there are said um, nodes which are indirect from the epsilon, which are really proper. And yeah, this path integral can be discretized and then the, the intuition um, that underlies this path integral optimization proposal is that the number of lattice points um, chosen in this discrete tracing is a measure for the complexity of the state. Um, now, um, the, the number of lattice points can be changed by um, changing the geometry or the background geometry in which one performs this path integral. And uh, it is known that this deformation by a well transformation um, changes the path integral measure by one share value of some usual action. Or to be more precise, um, an exponential of the difference of the one share value of the usual action. And then it has been proposed um, by Kapita Kumo, Miyagi, and Takanashi um, in 2017 that um, the minimum of this one share variable action. Um, should be identified with the complexity of X naught. And yeah, then one can actually, um, yeah, 
calculate um, that minimum of the real estimate and save it and then, then find um, that it was equivalent to the volume of time slices of F entropy to the real spaces. Which is quite good news for this um, complexity proposal, of course, because it reproduces um, the holographic complexity of the Australian proposal. Um, however, um, as we have seen um, from this definition, there are um, no gate sets, there exists no reference in state um, in this complexity definition. So these um, ingredients are a priori unknown. And it would, of course, um, be very nice um, to, to find um, interpretations of this um, fast integral optimization proposal in terms of um, unitary operators. I think. So it you know, turns out um, that these geometric actions, um, or the sum of two of these geometric actions, actually provide some such interpretations. Um, to um, find this interpretation, um, we actually um, take a bit of a detour by um, going to the gravity theory and it is Sorry, can, I, can, I, can I interrupt just for a question on the previous slide? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, can, can you expand a little bit about the last sentence? I mean, uh, what do you ask uh, for these uh, constant time slices of a space? Should they be extreme or something like that? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand your extremist of what? Uh, 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 what about these constant time slices? Should, should they satisfy some condition, geometric condition, like uh, they should be extremal or something similar? Oh, yeah. Um, these are actually the, the extremal um, slices um, that are supposed to constant time slices in the boundary relation. Yeah, I wasn't quite precise there. Um, one, one can um, consider particular examples of solutions of real equations of motion and plug these solutions back into the um, real actions. And the, the final result of, of this calculation is actually that um, the on-shell value of this real action um, is equivalent to the volume of some extremal slice in, in asymptotically ADS space. Okay, thanks. So, so and, and this is uh, explaining the reference that you write about. Yeah, this is explained in, in the reference. Yeah. Great, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, the reason why we're considering ADS three gravity um, is that both the real action and the sum of two um, Geometric actions for the real world group um, can actually be derived um, from parity in three dimensional anti-digital spaces. And this derivation um, proceeds, um, or it starts out with um, the three dimensional parity theory written in trans diamond form. And yeah, from this trans diamond form, one simply um, imposes asymptotically ADS3 boundary conditions, um, means that this SA2R connections, A and A bar, must fulfill um, certain properties as the radial coordinate R goes to infinity. And yeah, this um, um, calculation, which I won't review in detail here, um, one gets from this, um, yeah, by, by imposing these asymptotically ADS3 boundary conditions, one gets either um, the real world action or the sum of two real world geometric actions, depending um, on which parameter equation one, one chooses. So, um, now I have put here a footnote and said terms and conditions apply because um, it's not quite that simple. There are um, actually boundary terms which one has to take into account, at least. Um, and of course, um, Due to that reason, one cannot simply say that um, the real action is completely equivalent to the sum of two real world geometric actions. Um, however, um, for our purposes, um, these boundary terms um, drop out in the end, so um, we can simply neglect them. Um, now, the, the physical interpretation of um, this kind of action that is obtained by imposing certain boundary conditions. Um, on the gravity action um, is that this is um, a field theory of um, 
left or right moving boundary coefficients, meaning um, a field theory of um, three parameter stations um, that act non trivially on the boundary. So um, this is um, one um, kind of um, realization of, of a complexity equals action. Um, which also, uh, of course, um, quite different from um, the kind of action on the related bit test that one usually um, takes as the action in the complexity equals action proposal. So can I just ask you one more question here? Mm -hmm. So, so can you actually e interpret uh, what you just said before in terms of this slide? Like, for example, you said there is no smooth solutions. Uh, on for these geometric actions that uh, that you only have a jump in this diffeomorphism. So how how should I understand it from gravity? Like if I take some gravity with some time dependent cutoff, you're saying there should not be a smooth solutions, but you should only have jumps between one, two, and three D gravity. Well, I haven't really thought about um, the interpretation of, of these jumps in gravity before, but. Um, yeah, um, the, the equations of motion are, are quite the same since this is the same geometric action. So um, the, the solutions must also be the same. And so, um, so isn't from, this some kind of a paradox? So, so, so I, ha I have a comment. Uh, so, 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 if you allow to modify the structure, um, and like this is the weak side of the comment and allow for uh, a term in such an action that only has like one derivative, then, so, so you have like, for example, d plus phi, like absolute value, plus d minus phi absolute value uh, for, on each term, then such an action gives rise to basically an immediate jump uh, between, you know, like, like between the values of phi that you want to achieve. Uh, so, so this can happen. I mean, we, we commented on this with Ro, Hugo, and Johannes in, in 2018, but this is not the same action. So I, I, I'm not sure how to, how to reconcile it with, with this particular action. So here it's just a comment about gravity, right? Yeah, what, but what I'm trying to say is that like having, having phi at your disposal, you can also try to write other things. Um, and these things might not be geometric, but then they would have like this feature that they uh, allow for jumps. That is like that this phi, you know, like starts somewhere and goes somewhere and this happens like very, very quickly. And to be honest, um, I'm, I'm not sure why um, this jump um, should be disallowed for some reason in the gravity theory. Um, for me, this is um, simply some solution of the equation of motion, and when it definitely does jump instantaneously um, from the one state in Navama Moshe Shoot to another. Um, I don't see any particular reason why this um, should lead to any kind of problem in, in the quality theory. Well, okay, anyway, um, moving on. Um, we can use the fact that both the real action and the USO geometric action are derived from the same um, string balance action to um, find a mapping between the degrees of freedom in both actions, so between the Leo theory phi and the diffeomorphism f and f bar. And the mapping takes on the following form, so P is the logarithm of d sigma j, d sigma j bar, over one plus d t bar squared. And for someone familiar with the Leo theory, this will also look familiar since um, this is just um, the general resolution of the real world equations of motion. Um, so we see that um, one shell is real world action and the same ge geometric actions are actually the same. Now um, we can use this mapping for our functions to map um, 
the solutions of delivery is based on that they are considered in a fast and equal optimization proposal to differ morphisms. So it means we obtain a physical interpretation of um, the solutions of the neural equation in terms of um, conformal transformations, actually, on some level. So, however, again, it turns out that this interpretation is um, problematic since um, the different morphisms that are actually obtained, um, for example, um, for the case of pure ADSD, um, again, only lead to a phase change. So we see that, um, well, mathematically, um, we can find a mapping between um, the fast and equal optimization proposal and, yeah, the complexity so far is given as the sum of two geometric actions. Um, physically, um, this interpretation actually is not possible. Since, again, um, this is strange, strange, um, not observable. Okay, uh, a short summary. Um, so we found um, we found an um, um, exact equivalence um, between the complexity for conformal transformations and a geometric action by choosing a certain suitable cost function and in particular by including um, phases from the central exchange material. Basically. And this um, yields first of all a direct relation between the complexity functional and the gravity theory, and also an interpretation of the fast and equal optimization proposal in terms of unitary operators of momentum space. And we also saw that um, this complexity functional was related to a very phase for conformal transformations. But as it turned out, um, the interpretation of this geometric action um, as a complexity method is problematic for, for two reasons. First of all, um, the optimal paths are kind of degenerate and they immediately jump from reference to target space. And second of all, um, the complexity only measures the phase change and this then takes into account the gauge invariance that actually runs this function. Now, um, in our paper, we also considered a Cartoon symmetry group. Um, in this case, um, the equivalence to the geometric action also holds. And yeah, by suitably defining the whole cost function. However, um, we do get um, quite different results for the optimal paths. Um, in, the, in the case of Katsumi symmetry groups, we actually find optimal paths that interpolate smoothly between reference and target space. And in this case, the complexity also measures um, yeah, non trivial um, contributions um, that are not just phase changes. Now, um, let me come to the conclusions. Um, I think um, our work um, mainly has some implications for the choice of cost function um, in, yeah, in, in complexity, in particular for conformal transformations. So um, I think th the first conclusion, and one can often this, um, is about um, one norm versus two norm cost functions. So, um, what we used was basically a one norm cost function. So the absolute value of um, the expectation value of um, our implementation in the gauge. However, one could also choose the two norm cost function, which is the square root of the um, absolute value of t square. However, um, as derived um, already by Kasuda and Lacan, um, the leading order in the central class, at last central class, actually agrees between the two norm and two norm. Now, um, this is um, this fact um, actually um, is kind of surprising um, since T2 norm is nothing but the canonical distance measure in the Hilbert space from the inner product, um, simply because um, the state at time t plus dt is somewhat like 1 plus i times u applied onto the psi. So, um, psi of t plus dt minus psi of p is something like q applied onto psi. And yeah, the length of q times psi is simply this two norm cost function. And this, of course, um, must be non zero and must be non constant. Um, therefore, um, one immediate conclusion is um, that this 
Stadt leben kann, ohne dass der Interessenter das als extremely important und um, anstatt um, not stop this, um, this stop leaving kind and maybe consider even just this stop leaving kind and um, of course this is um, closely related to um, a cost function that is given by the Houdini study matrix um, that is just um, the square root of um, the F2 norm squared minus the one norm squared so this gives you basically only the stop leaving kinds and Usually, the argument that um, the two norm is the canonical distance measure under the Hilbert space and does non is within the study matrix and um, must definitely give something extra here. And if you want to see more details on this, um, I suggest you can look in a recent paper by um, Mario Florian, where I say this is discussed in more detail. And yeah, another um, conclusion is that. Um, Maybe it makes more sense um, to um, not consider um, geometric actions um, as the basic building blocks of your complexity functional, but instead go one step back and consider a metric on, on the real flow group and use this um, to define this point on, in this um, real flow group. And of course, that's also a cost function. And yeah, has also already um, pointed out by Katrina and Akan, um, by um, choosing a metric on a real flow group, the minimization of the complexity function can be done via the well known Euler Arnold method. And in particular, for certain simple choices of the metric, um, the, the simplest of these is just the inner product on, on the real flow algebra. Um, this minimization has already or was already performed um, by um, mathematical physicists and um, they obtained um, the well known wave equations, like for example the Kotelik de Vries equations as the equations of motion. And these, of course, do have a well known exact and in particular non trivial solution. So um, this suggests um, that these kind of uh, cost functions um, are a more suitable choice. And um, yeah, this sounds like um, a good choice that one could actually um, derive um, or um, where, one can look, where one could look at particular examples um, of, of cost functions and calculate complexity explicitly for some examples. And, See whether one can find a match to the cost two theory. Yeah, with that, um, I'm ending my talk and thank you all for listening. Okay, Marius, thank you very much. That nice talk. Um, are there any more questions? I have one question. Uh, so thanks for the nice talk, Marius. Thank you. Uh, can you go back to the berry berry face slide? Yeah. So you said that you also worked on Katsmudi groups. How does this berry face does it change? Have you looked at the berry phase in the Katsmudi case? No, we actually haven't done that. This was of course the, uh, something very interesting, which we should definitely. Um, Okay, and so this thing uh, here is it simple? So I have, I would like to know what exactly the Berry face is. Usually, it's just the in, uh, the, the Berry connection. Uh, is it just the integrand here, or is it is that a little more subtle? Um, I don't to be honest, I, I don't quite remember. And this is um, discussed and. Um, in this paper. All right, good. This discussion is very understandable, so I, I think um, it's much better if you just read it and if I explain to you something that I don't remember fully. Either, so. All right, thanks.
Any more comments, questions? All right, well, if not, then let's uh, thank Marius again.